to connect with you, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's been a it's been a hectic month since since uh we arranged this. How's my audio now? Audio is good. Audio is good. Good. Excellent. That'll work. That'll work. I'm in no hurry. I'm relaxed. I got all my air my errands taken care of for the day. Whatever you want to shoot the shit about, I'm all for it, man. Oh, good, Brent. Look, I don't have anything organized at all. Nothing. I like all I've, and I'll be honest, all I've managed to do is look at about half of your Phoenix videos. I actually went to your website and, um, <laughs> like I said to you, I was kind of put off by someone you, you were being interviewed by. And I thought, oh, another one of these people, you know. And then I started looking at your stuff. And I thought, actually, I'm learning a bit off this guy. This is sort of interesting, you know. And like you say, some people might see you as arrogant or whatever, you know, or, or, or egotistical. And I, I, that was my first impression. I've got to be honest. Then I looked more at your stuff and I said, no, he's not egotistical. He's just confident in his information. And that's actually really refreshing and really inspiring to see someone who has that level of confidence in their information. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't have anything prepared. I, you just really got me with that um, Phoenix narrative. And I was looking at one of your videos and, and you mentioned Phaeton. And I thought, wow, that's, I was really impressed when I heard you mention Phaeton. I don't know too many people who know about the, uh, the story right. of Phaeton and stuff like this. This cat, man, I tell you. And um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I was just impressed. And, and when you, you got me, because I've looked at the pyramids so much as well. I mean, I figured out that geopolymer back in 2005 and all of this sort of stuff. Right, and, right. Um, and then I, I, I'd never noticed that 138 year number in there, you know, 130. Of course, I'm not looking for it. But uh, I'm very interested in this. You've got two numbers, 138 years and what, 200, 562 years is the other one, I think. Oh, 552. 552, yeah. Yeah, uh, 552 was the ancient Phoenix cycle. And it's actually 138 times four. So and for, there was a period of time, which I have documented, which shows several 552-year periods that were very, very catastrophic. So it was impregnated within the ancient mindset that every four times this thing visits, it's going to do a total all-out fallout destruction. But the three times in the interim, it would be seen, but the destructions would only be highly localized. It wouldn't be hemispheric or worldwide. Only its fourth passage was ever totally destructive. And this pattern maintained for about 2,000, 2,500 years. Okay, and then it changed. And now it's yes, happening it on the 138-year cycle, as you're suggesting. Yes, yes. I mean, it was always on the 138-year cycle. It's just, uh, like I said, 552 is 138 times 4. It's just for some reason, around 2653 B.C. to 2239 B.C., which you know of as the Great Flood, and then uh, 1687 B.C., which is 552 years later, which was the most devastating, historically documented event the world has ever known. The Great Flood was not the most devastating. The Ogaijian Deluge was. We have records about the Ogaijian Deluge all around the world. What happened to the world in 1687 BC? That was 552 years after the Great Flood. Then 552 years after that was 1135 BC, where again Phoenix appears, but it's not really destructive, but it is noticed around the world. However, one culture of people, the Tuathidae and actually weaponized that information. They had astronomical records in their possession from the house of Atreus, and they used that information, and they weaponized it against the Furbolgs when they invaded Ireland in the Second Battle of Moitura. They waited for May 15th, and as soon as the Phoenix phenomenon was beginning, they landed their fleets and ships, and they invaded, and the inhabitants of ancient Ireland were taken off guard, thinking that the invaders were actually controlling the darkness of the sun. And uh, 552 years later after that was 583 B.C. where Thales, where Thales of Miletus actually predicted the event. And uh, 583 B.C. is also the date moniker in Greek that is found on, on the ancient Antikythera computer, which was found from a shipwreck off, of, off the coast of Crete. And it was, uh, it was discovered in 1900. It was cleaned and studied in 1901, but in 1902, it was brought to the public's attention. It just, just so happens 1902 is also a Phoenix year. All these things begin coming right back around 
I mean, this perfection in the ancient calendar, Max, and the events that have happened every 138 years is is a reason why that after a year, a whole lifetime of being a Southern Baptist Christian, I now embrace simulation theory. It's too perfect. Mm, yeah, look, I've been uh, leaning towards this for many, many years. Of course, it's really difficult to find concrete evidence of it. I mean, you can find so much stuff that suggests that you know, we're in some sort of controlled environment. No matter what you think the Earth is, we are in a controlled environment. There's no doubt. And, and no doubt. I've been thinking this since I was a kid, but it's like I said, it's, it's difficult to uh, to find the evidence. You were in a, like for, for my listeners, people that, that may not have come across you before, I actually mentioned you a few times, so I'm imagining a lot of my listeners have probably gone over and checked you out in the last few Good. weeks. Thank you. But, but um, hang, hang on a minute. Let me just start uh, sure. out what's going on out here for a second, brother. Let me Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll edit this shit out. This, uh, <laughs> sorry about this, man. I can edit this shit out, you know. Um, yeah, no my landlord's just got home. He's not happy with one of the tenants, but uh, <laughs> I've been seeing the guy for two months. This is my hi, hey, Max. Yeah, right. But um, yeah, for my listeners, I'll, I'll just would have edited that out. But for my listeners, sorry, folks, bit of an edit there, bit of a bit of a carry on in the in the guest house. But um, for my listeners, you haven't heard of you. Come on, Ron, please. <sighs> I can't, I can't hear anything, but I can tell you can. Oh, it's, it's loud. It'll be on, on the recording. But anyway, bit of an incident there, folks. That's all good in the guest house. But uh, um, for my listeners, you haven't heard much of your stuff. I mean, you, you were in a pretty unique position. You probably told this story a million times. But, you know, just give us the nutshell version of how you got access to all this information that you're able to share with everybody. Well, uh, there was two reasons why I, was, I had that ability one was being in prison and two in texas prison there are guys who have been doing doing prison sentences uh who have inherited libraries collections of books from guys that have been doing time since the 1800s there are there are many old prisons in texas and those those books from those libraries were boxed away and put away and when new prisons were built like in 1993 94 95 i went to prison in 1990 when i was 17 years old but there was this huge prison industrial complex this building where 116 prisons were built across texas texas is huge and there was all kinds of new draconian penal laws drug laws they, it was all specifically designed to put a lot of people away and to make a lot of people rich because they put factories manufacturing logistics factories in all these prisons but the benefit that i had was that in building all these new prisons uh Many of the older prisons had these massive libraries, these these 180 and 90 year old prisons. And a lot of those books were boxed up and they were supposed to make it to new prisons. But humanitarians on the outside had other ideas. They donated truckloads from schools, high schools and colleges that had closed down or been foreclosed on in Texas. All those libraries were boxed up and volunteers brought those books to the prisons. So the new prisons got all these books from all these libraries, whereas all the older books that were in prison already were boxed away and put in storages in different prison units. And because I was one of my jobs for, for the unit was SSI, I was supposed to catalog everything that was in every cubby hole in every prison all the all the storages all the basements everywhere all the old cell blocks that have been condemned that were now being used as storages so for years i just went through all these old buildings and i just collected all these books and i traded once i read books i traded with all the other prisoners that had very old books as well so that's one reason why the archaics data is so unique. The other reason is, is because I had 26 years to do it. And very few people, very few people in the free world have that time. They have societal obligations, family obligations. They're raising families. They're, they're working. They have hobbies, entertainment. They're dating. I never had any of that. All I was doing day to day was reading, absorbing information, taking notes and sending my notes home. So in a nutshell, that's how I acquired my education. And this is why I'm always telling people on the Archaics channel that you can guarantee that 100% of my data is, is, is from original books and reports. I take absolutely no data points or data sets from the Internet. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. Like it's uh, it's almost like you worked this out before you came, like you put yourself in a position where you would have access. I mean, what's the chances of someone 
going to jail that early in their life and then spending like 26 years or something in prison and yep. being interested in this stuff and then being given a job where you've got access to all this information. You know, I mean, I that's, was, that's, that's amazing. I, didn't ask for it. I, I agree with you. It is very coincidental. It's very amazing, but I did not sign up for that. Max, oh, you're not looking at somebody who went to prison innocent. I was a criminal. I was 17 years old. I had been living on the streets for two years. I ran away when I was 15 years old from a family that was very doing very well off. However, it was Southern Puritan. It was Southern Baptist Puritanism that ran that basically induced me to leave that family. I was adopted off the streets. My mother was a prostitute. My mother was my mother was involved in a lot of stuff that a lot of people won't agree with. But she was very young and it's forgivable. She was 16. So she was so terrified of the pain of giving birth to a child that a specialist in Houston in 1973 had her had her do a, a, a one of those induced births in a bathtub where she's heavily sedated. Well, she was unconscious the entire time I was born in a bathtub in 1973. But but she gave me and my sister up for adoption. At five years old, I was adopted by, by a family that took me in. But the wife, the mother in that family, Mrs. Brashears, was a church administrator and she's of the worst kind of personalities my max anybody who believes that they are truly allied to god and god is on their side they can justify anything they do to anybody else and this is the type of mentality she had and i watched this for the 10 years i was with that family and it sickened me and i could not go to church five times a week for the rest of my life while i was with them so at 15 years old i left and for two years i was on the streets i ended up falling in with the wrong crowd but I, most of that time, I was working odd jobs, roofing. But then toward the end of that two years, I was 17 years old. I fell in with the wrong crowd. And, yeah, I deserved to go to prison. I didn't deserve to stay that long, but that's a whole other story. Once I was in prison, I, pr I pretty much fully immersed in a prison culture. I got more time stacked on my sentence, and I, I did it to myself, Max. But uh, I agree with you. It's amazing, but uh, I'm no victim here. I did put myself oh, no. in that position. Oh no, I'm not not suggesting you are a victim, but it's almost like you you your life deliberately put you in that situation where you would have access to this information. Because I find it amazing that someone with a mind like yours would would end up in that position, and that's what you'd end up doing in prison. We're See, looking after yeah, libraries and cataloging books. I mean, what are the chances? Yeah, what are I the agree. Chances, it was know? pretty unique. It was pretty unique. I was I was raised reading. I was raised Max. Yeah, I can agree with you on one one point here. I was raised in libraries because one thing that my mother did is she forced us to go to public library, and every single week I, I had to check out two books. One of them had to be nonfiction, and I had to give a report before I was able to to uh, uh, check out two more books. We went every week, and the other book could be fiction. That, that was my that was my reward for reading the nonfiction. So we weren't allowed to watch, watch TV unless it was uh, after dinner and it was with the family and it was always one or two programs. Then it was homework and the bed. I lived a very very structured life. It was Puritan pilgrimism, and uh, I rebelled from that. But it did instill. You're right. It did instill in mm -hmm. me this librarian attitude. This this want to absorb a lot of data and information. You're right about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, things things happen for a reason, brother, and sometimes the path is a difficult one, but, you know, you look where it leads in the end. So getting back to this whole um, um, Phoenix event, you're, you're, like, very specific with this, which is another thing that impresses me. There's not too many people who are very specific with dates, who are willing to put their, their reputation and everything on the line and say, well, this on this day, and you're literally, like, saying May 15th or May 16th or something. Yes. May, May, May 16th, 2040 or something, you're saying, is it? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. And it's not it's not speculation. All I'm doing is quoting the exact date from ancient records from different cultures, uh, different timekeeping systems. When you study them and look at look at them in a chart on paper and you find out the dates of cataclysmic events and those and then you just and then you find out what they were describing in the Ramayana, what they're describing in the Mayan Popol Vuh, what they're describing in the in the old uh, texts of Anaximander and Aristarchus, what we find in the Jewish Haggadah in, in the book of Jasher. There are so many different references like the, the Dutch Oral End Manuscript or the Colburn Bible. When we find the exact same phenomenon appearing in the sky and the results happening uh, among, um, you know, among civilizations, 
can we find the date monikers and all these texts? You look at them, it's always the middle of May. There's, there's two cataclysmic dates that are threaded throughout the entire history of the world, and it's two different timelines, and it's two different objects that appear in the sky. One of them I call the Nemesis X object. X just means unknown factor, but it's the Nemesis X object. It appears every 792 years like clockwork. The other one is the Phoenix phenomenon, and it's every 138 years in the month of May on the 15th or 16th, depending upon what hemisphere. I am very specific because once you see the data, you just can't argue with it. I mean, this is it. Every single time it appeared, it was at that exact same time. And it's 138 years on the dot. Last time was 1902, for which I have five videos. The time before that was 1764. Uh, the time before that was 1626, then 1488, 1350, 1212. I can go, I can go 138 years all the way back to about 58 centuries and, and catalog basically every time it happened. And it's always red rain, red mud, red fallout from the sky. The sun goes dark, the moon, the moon turn, red, turns red. Sometimes gravel and rocks fall from the sky. Cities and civilizations are absolutely buried. There are mass vanishings in a, a, of people, uh, inexplicable, don't know where they go, what happens to them. Their bodies are not found among the ruins. And uh, every single time there are baby booms that happened after these events and uh, uh, there, are, there are edits in our holography which are not explainable by natural phenomenon showing that the Phoenix phenomenon is something far different than some natural occurrence of some uh, of maybe an intruder planet going coming too close to Earth and the glacial sphere ripping off more materials that's full of organic compounds and ice and, and gravel. That would that used to be my original theory when I my first three public my first three books about the Phoenix were published. That was my original theory. That was before I embraced simulation theory. But there that was because I was basically ignoring so much data about other things that were happening that are inexplicable. These edits and these real strange resets like I've documented for 1902. It's a this that's why it's no longer called Phoenix Cataclysms. I call it the Phoenix phenomenon because that's what it is. Something very unusual is happening, and it's in these edits and these changes in our holography and in, in the institutions and in governments and economies. These changes are subtle, but they have major impacts. I mean, just in 1902 alone, hundreds of companies appeared that did not exist in 1901. It's inexplicable. I've listed them. Many of my subscribers have even given me more to add to that list. Uh, organizations, institutes, whole weird things that just suddenly appeared in 1902 and, and then. Uh, were built upon 1903, 1904. And these aren't just any companies. These are the Fortune 500 companies that are running the world today. They had their beginning in 1902. Some of them had their beginning in 1903, 04, 05, 06, because it was basically the same companies, but they're now umbrellas creating sub companies underneath them. It's still the same order organizations. But there's no trace of them in the historical record in 1901, in 1900, in 1899. This is inexplicable. And the same thing happened in 1764. 1764, the entire world was run by monarchies. As soon as the Phoenix phenomenon happened, now all of a sudden monarchies are all being overthrown at the exact same time. The United States appears on the scene, a uh, becomes, a, becomes a republic. Republics and democracies took over all the monarchies of the entire world except the crown, except the British crown. So this is, and it happened fast like dominoes. The French Revolution was basically the end of that period, the Napoleonic period. But we can go back all throughout time and see this. It's dynamic, these major changes on the world. So this is what made me go into the legends and myths about the Phoenix. What the hell is the Phoenix? Why is there so little about it? And, uh, and this is what made me realize, okay, this is a, a unique phenomenon because the texts of the Gnosis are very specific. The, the Phoenix is a benefactor protocol. It is to put the archons in check. The archons are always described as lords of time and lords over human populations that do their bidding, like the collective. They're like, they're like egomaniacal little rulers that know that they're a little bit more. Hmm. You've dropped out. It's actually common on me with Zoom, and my own subs are even patient on live on live presentations. I got to come back in sometimes, and I, I got a I have a Wi Fi booster and everything, but I I don't I live pretty far from civilization. No, that's okay. So you were saying like the archons, the are in control of everything, and this is like a reset sort of a thing. 
But that's yeah, something that I found really inspiring about one of one of your videos that I watched that when you said it's like a safety mechanism. Well, there's a possibility that it's a safety mechanism to stop these parasites um, continuing their reign because they just get to a certain point and it's almost like they get to that point and they're aware of this is going to happen. So they further consolidate their power every time. Then they go to their underground bases or wherever they go. Half of them probably survive, half of them don't. Who knows? And yeah. um, they've already got their new plan for what the new world they're going to create looks like like you say they came back with the monarchy and you know, that we got it to that point for a while and then we come back with our corporate system now they seem to be constructing this whole smart system that they want to create an interesting thing um i'm finding and like when you look at this i've often argued like the um the concept of ai artificial intelligence which i i prefer to call um autonomic intelligence and what we're actually creating is virtual life you know, when you understand what right. life is, life is simply this electrical thing. And I speculate that artificial intelligence or, or, or virtual life is already what's been in control of these these resets that keep happening because some of this stuff that's going on, I mean, it's, this doesn't appear to be coming from a human mind. This is way too organised, what this right. is. And, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that because I noticed when I looked at your website, you said uh, it's Archaic X and this was... Okay, with the AI X being right, the right. Uh, yeah, and um, I found that quite interesting. And when you say this is a simulation, what what are you referring to it as? Because when people say this is a simulation, this is something a problem I've had with people when I say we're, it's like we're in uh, a simulated reality. Um, people automatically think, you know, we're in like lying in pods, we're in the matrix, rah, 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 and this is all virtual, you know, and right. it, it may not be like that. It may be like, you know, the Hunger Games or whatever, a reality within a reality, you know, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I call it archaics because it is indeed an acronym. So the AIX in archaics is artificial intelligence X, again, like Nemesis X, I am admitting an unknown factor. I am admitting that I have pr produced enough data points and data sets to show you that this is a, a verifiable phenomenon. But at the same token, I am I'm leaving it up to your interpretation as to what it is. It's an X factor. And in science, X factor is basically an unknown factor. It's you know, We know enough about it to know that it exists, but we don't know why or the what of it. So when it comes to AIX, you're right. There is something governing over the affairs of the affairs of humans. Our world is, is a construct, but AIX is not the same as what I refer to as the simulacrum. So, okay, my audio still good? Yeah, yeah, still good, brother. I'm just trying to okay. um, um, work out this Zoom. It tells me it wants to end the meeting. Okay. I didn't know I had to upgrade. Oh, uh, we can start. We can start another one. You yeah. can. If it uh, if it ends the meeting um in ten minutes, so I'll, I'll probably get a message and um I'll um we'll just Zoom change. yeah Zoom change Zoom change their deal to forty minute segments now. Mm. I'm finding so, that out. So anyway, uh yeah, well uh, we can always switch over and just just reinitiate and you can edit that. Yeah, yeah, but, that's all good. So yeah, yeah, go on. Give me your thoughts on on what you're perceiving. So, your, your I of AIX, what it all means, and and what you're referring, like the simulacrum. I think that's an interesting, um, interesting word. So well, I do believe that the, we are inside a construct, and that construct is not good nor evil. It is absolutely neutral field, and. This construct has many physics constants. These are protocols. We, we, we've we come to understand them as entropy. We understand them as the law of diminishing returns. We understand them as, as phi and as pi, as, as inertia, obliquity. We understand these concepts, but they seem to be universal throughout the simulacrum. They apply to all systems, not just nature. They apply to the events of people's lives, the events of world history. These same mathematical protocols we have always believed were physical are actually being found now in space-time phenomena in the patterns of unfolding events in the days of a man's life or in the years of world history the years of nations and empires so 
Oh, this is the value of the archaics research. I show where these same physics constants are also in the patterns of time itself. They're not just in physical manifestations of phenomena. So this simulacrum is a beautiful thing. There's nothing evil about it. It, uh, it doesn't care. It, it doesn't have any personal feelings toward what you do. Or any. All it does is reflect back. It is a it is a beautiful construct that interfaces with you with the central nervous system. It will reflect back as circumstances anything that you broadcast and for you to accurately broadcast anything you're broadcasting things all the time but for you to broadcast anything it's all about your informed field because every single one of us have an informed field and in that informed field max every single thing you have ever come into contact with and accepted to be true empowers that informed field and gives it its charge this is what the simulacrum responds to, how you view reality, not how your neighbor views it. This is why two different people being raised fundamentally different can live in the same world, but they exist in totally different universes and can experience totally different totally different things. This goes for individuals. It also go, goes for a whole entire cultures. This is why people raised in fundamentalist Islam just can't wrap their minds around how anybody could be a Christian and, and and vice versa. This is why the in in the in the in the in the East, this is why there's so much contention against the Taoists and again and the Chinese with the Muslim incursions into the Southeast Asia. They can't wrap their mind. They're from fundamentally different paradigms. So the simulacrum will always reflect back as circumstances the things that you broadcast from your informed field. This is how you change your life. This is how you bring things into contact with you that you ordinarily would never be able to, to, to get in your life. This is how you gravitate people and circumstances all around the world to you and your immediate environment. So this also applies to the phoenix and it applies to the cataclysms and this is why i tell people yes i have a very harrowing message but it's for the collective because if you're an errant if you are recognized by the system itself as being a malfunction you're not with the collective you're vibrating at a different frequency then there's nothing you have to fear about eschatology about the end of the world doomsday cataclysm protocols because they do not apply to you whatsoever the simulacrum operates on frequencies and frequencies alone this is why the same message being delivered to two different peoples would mean two different things and this is what this is the value we have in in the scriptures the scriptures are basically an amalgamation of ancient texts from all over the world that were later passed through a Jewish filter and basically Hebraicized to make the Jews basically the rulers of the entire world. But the original passages that they borrowed from older texts didn't convey this. They put that in there. But when people read a lot of this, if you're vibrating on a higher spiritual frequency, you're going to get spiritual food out of, out of the scriptures. If you're vibrating on a low frequency, a base frequency, then you're going to see the negative. The negative. You're going to fear. You're going to fear the hellfire. You're going to see all the negativity that's put in the scriptures for that purpose. It's a. That's what it's. That's my main message, Max. All throughout my entire channel is that we exist every single day in two different realities you can participate with the collective if you want to or you can be a malfunction you can be an errant and, and live an entirely diverse and different life and not have to worry about any of this stuff on mainstream media any of this stuff that's coming in the near future with the phoenix nemesis x object for unfolding of the apocalypse you don't have to worry about any of it whatever you experience is in direct is in direct uh link with how you're vibrating with that information. You're totally speaking my language, brother. This is something that I often talk to people about as like the uh, the law of reflection. When, I, no. when I'm saying a reality will mirror, or the law of mirroring, reality will mirror back to you what you put into it, which is exactly how I've changed my life. I've done whole shows about this. I've done movies about this. I mean, this is exactly the language that I've been conveying. I love the way you put all that. That was, that was brilliant, what you're broadcasting. Thank you. It will broadcast back to you. And even when you think about that, you know, like I've said, you know, this world is a, is a reflection of, of our collective consciousness. And we get to a certain point of malfunctioning as a, as a general species where this reset has to happen. I mean, right. if you needed to purify human consciousness, how would you go about it? 
you know. And even with the the, um, the jab and all of this sort of stuff, when you really start looking into what's in these injections that they're giving people and the nanotech and the whole concept of leading people's consciousness into a mainframe and whatever, it may even be a way of just purifying human consciousness for the next reset. I mean, all of this may be seen as safety mechanisms from the way I'm looking at it anyway. Cool. That's why I don't have anything to fear with all this stuff that's coming. I see it as a necessary cleansing. You know, it's unfortunate. A lot of people are going to suffer, but ultimately it's their choice to do so. You know, and that, that's a, that's an amazing thing. I really like the uh, the way you put all this. Like I said, there haven't been too many people I've come across the last few years where I've actually been able to learn something from and, and get a new perspective on things from. You know, so you see so many people, you know, oh, yeah, I looked at that and I've looked at that and I've looked at that. But with this timeline that you found, which seems to be a reoccurring thing, and the fact that, like, the fact that it's so on point, it's in May all the time, and it's 138 years, and it's like on the money all the time. This is not natural. This is a this is a mechanism, which which lends a lot of credence and a lot of support to the concept that this is some sort of simulated reality. It's almost like wh whatever this evil is, this archon energy. It's almost like it's trapped in this in this bubble that we're in. Right. And, uh, right. If we can come into the world, I've often said, you know, one of the biggest problems in our in our existence here is that we value knowledge and information over wisdom. Very often, a lot of the stuff that we're looking for, we already know it. We know this if we look inside us, but we, we seek for confirmation from external sources because we don't believe in ourselves. We you know, yeah. you know, if we could just step into that path of wisdom, I think we could change this whole world and reset the whole thing in a day. And I think we're given every opportunity to do that. When it gets to a certain point where obviously we, we're not going to do it, well, then the reset has to happen and maybe these events happen. I mean, uh, maybe it's set up that way. Well, I don't uh, I don't want to convey convey to you that just because it's been documented, documented for 58 centuries that it's going to continue. I have also documented the terminus. It was from the very beginning set up to stop at a certain point. Actually, well, something I want to butt in there and mention as well is that's something you said as well with the pyramid. You're thinking that the pyramid may be some sort of a switch for all of this sort yeah. of stuff. I mean, I'm one of yeah. the only people who've probably gone and looked at the pyramid in Cairo and thought, like, I can't find anything good about this structure. It's amazing, all the coding in it, but all of that coding, which is all everything to do with this reality we're in, I mean, yes, that's in there for a reason. That's And that's not there just to convey the information to you. If you had to create some sort of a psychic program thing, object, whatever, you would need to right. encode all of that information of this reality into it for it to be able to perform its function. And right. I, I just, I, I, uh, oh, that was funny. <laughs> I forgot all about the meeting was going to end. You know, hey, you were, hey, you were on a roll, just like I was on a roll last time. Yeah, I mean, this is a great conversation, but yeah, I, I just don't see anything good about the pyramid. I'm one of those people who always thought this was used somehow to create a schism. This is this is not something we need to participate in this reality, were this reality in its natural form. That's the feeling that I got when I when I went to Cairo. Have you ever been to Cairo? You go to Cairo, the pyramid's right there in the middle of town, you know? Uh, Max, Max, I have never left the United States. Yeah, well, you go there and you think, oh, they show you all these pictures of the pyramid. It's right there in the, in the middle of Cairo. Right, and you right. You get there and Cairo gives you the feeling, if there's any, uh, like it, it, it gives you the feeling of a city that is in a state of permanent growth and permanent decay at the same time. And right. even though the colours once used to be beautiful, now they're all taking on the hue of the desert. And I, when I, the first time I went to Cairo, I said to the guy that I was travelling with, I said, if there's anything, any city on earth that could stand as evidence to prove the existence of the Archons, it's Cairo. The yeah. feeling that you get when you're in there, it's just a, it's a really, really weird place. So, um, yeah, that, I, I wanted to get your take on that as well. The fact that the, you, you see the pyramid as a switch and blah, blah, blah. So, well, the, the, my discoveries on, first of all, I followed. I didn't. I didn't. In, I, I didn't inject myself into the research on Giza like a lot of modern authors did, coming from a modern perspective. I started with Norton, the very first historian, a European historian. He's in the 1730s who actually went and studied the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx and wrote everything. I started with Norton, uh, Lewis Norton. From there, I went into. I went into John Taylor. I went into Robert Robert Greve. Or excuse me, excuse me, John Greve. 
Reeves. These men were 350 years ago studying the Great Pyramid, and I followed their reasoning, I followed their studies, and then I was blessed with John Taylor's work, and then Robert Menzies, and then Charles Piazzi Smith. I have his book back here from uh, 1881. Charles Piazzi Smith is uh, The Great Pyramid. This is a very old book, very old book, absolutely packed, packed with data. I followed all his reasoning. He got charts, tables, illustrations on the Great Pyramid. Oh, very, just fascinating book. So I followed all his material, and because this man was a member of academia, and because of what he was saying about the Great Pyramid, it elicited a response from the Royal Astronomical Society, and they sent a heavyweight to Egypt. That heavyweight was, was Sir Flinders Petrie. Sir Flinders Petrie went and he studied the, the Great Pyramid, and he was the first scientist and basically the only scientist who's ever gone through the Great Pyramid with a micrometer and measured every single linear and rectilinear distance to the thousandth of an inch. Now, in the, incorpor in the incorporation of the archaics data in my theory, Sir Flinder P Petrie's uh, measurements, the only ones that are backed up by academia, the only ones that are supported by Egyptology, not his measurements, but the ones that were done to the thousandth of the inch, those are the ones I go by, and those are the ones that show the 138-year measurements all throughout the Great Pyramid everywhere. All my videos, you've seen the videos where I show 138 mm, going Yeah, yeah. Mm. That's, so, what really, that's what really pulled me into this, that, that, that number that you found in the pyramid. So I've done a lot of work on the pyramid. It's one of the things, it's one of the things actually, when I was four, I found out we had to pay to be alive. I was horrified, and I, yeah. I, that's when I kind of woke up. And then when <laughs> yeah. I was eight and my mother showed me a picture of the pyramids, I wanted to know how they were built. I wanted to find out about them so i've looked at these things all my life and i've never seen this 138 number it would ne never had any relevance to me anyway it didn't mean anything to me i never noticed the number so right. when, I, when i heard you talking about that and the fact that this may be a switch and it's and this is all stuff that i've had on the like you know you get you get data and you just put it there and wait till something comes along to confirm it and, and wait right. till it can be reinforced by other stuff and i haven't found anything to reinforce some of these vague rabbit holes i've gone down in the years until i actually came across your work which was well, what really pulled me into it that and you mentioned fate well, let me uh, well let me let me well, let me explain why that is it's uh <clears throat> first of all a lot of other researchers some of them some of them you may know uh, they have YouTube channels, and some of them are pretty popular. They 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 get frustrated with me. They send me all this data about what they've personally discovered in the Great Pyramid, and I'm always sending them letters. And I've basically cut off communication with a lot of people, other authors and stuff, because I, I, there's only so many times I can tell them. I says, listen, you're going to find every physics constant and every type of parallel and, and coincidence in the measurements of the Great Pyramid because they had to be there. Mm -hmm. In order to secretly upload an interference pattern, it was necessary first to, to in stone replicate the actual physics of the world we're in. You had to create an artificial template first in order to put the disguised protocol inside of it, which is the 138 year uh, protocol because the phoenix phenomenon was already going on before the the great pyramid was built that tells me we have we have we have documented phoenix cataclysms before uh, giza was ever built the great pyramid structure and all that that tells me that the stories of inky and the stories of enoch are true there is a benefactor who did something secret and for this he was later regarded as the trickster and the enemy the enemy but but it's the enemy of the archons. It's the enemy of God, because the God of this construct is not the God of Aaron's. The true immortal oversoul is on the outside of this construct and only communicates to those of us within who are attached to him or her through intuition, empathy, and imagination. Everything totally else speak in my language, but everything, totally else in this language. World, everything physical in this world, every symbol, every image, every name. If you attach it to the idea of the Godhead, you're only giving glory to the God of this world, which, according to the Gnosis and the New Testament writings, is the adversary, the Satan. He's the true. He's the true. This is this is what I call artificial intelligence X. This is the one masquerading as God. Hyperinflated ego appeared in the Old Testament as Yahweh, bloodthirsty, murderous SOB, and uh. 
He's the God of liars. But he has he has a large following right here in this construct. And the apocalypse is for them. This why this is why it can't be stopped until after the apocalypse. The Great Pyramid can't be activated until it receives the, the chief cornerstone. The chief cornerstone has been missing ever since the construction of the monument. The monument was activated for a few seconds during the vapor canopy world, which was before you know this in Genesis as the world before the flood. This is the uh the but that's when it was constructed. But when Enoch, well, the story of Enoch vanishing into heaven is the same one as Etana, the Sumerian king vanishing mm. into heaven. His work was done. He built a monument and told the rest of that civilization that it had something to do with a pump station. It was a holy axis mundi and that all it was the center of the world. And he made up all this BS because AIX cannot read the human mind. It can only read cortisol levels and hormonal levels it can guesstimate what you intend to do by what you've done in the past. It can't read the, 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 the mind because the mind isn't anything what science tells you it is. The mind is actually immortal, and, and the brain is nothing but uh, basically an organism that releases all the necessary hormones to comport with whatever that mind is thinking. Central nervous system does just the opposite of what science tells us. It's a filter. So this, uh, this AIX was fooled during the vapor canopy world into believing this was a giant pump station pulling up water, maybe hydrogen free energy for whatever soldier, uh, civilization and infrastructure was there at the time. Everybody was on board with this. Only the architect himself knew that within the measurements was coded a collapse protocol inside this, this uh, structure. So when it was activated, it had all the physics constants, like I said, of obliquity and entropy and, and all the different laws of physics. It had everything in there with pi and phi, all the all, all the math mathematics of our, of our of our simulacrum is encoded within the Great Pyramid. And that's why these other authors get frustrated with me, because I tell them all the time, you'll spend the rest of your life isolating these particulars. They're not the focus of the pyramid. The focus of the pyramid is this 138-year timeline. And the only thing in world history that obeys a 138-year timeline and can be shown with multiple sources is the Phoenix phenomenon. It's the only thing. So the pyramid had to have been created secretly to collapse the simulacrum, and the vehicle by which that collapse is going to happen is after that chief cornerstone is put on the top of that monument. Once that cornerstone, the, the stone the builders rejected, is put on top of that monument, then it's able to be activated again, and when it does, it will collapse this holography. When that holography is collapsed, we have a whole series of prophecies that will be fulfilled such as the benefactor came to do what? He came to set the captives free. Who are the captives? Those of us here who don't belong. So this is, it all ties in. This isn't anything arbitrary I'm making up. These are prophecies and eschatology pulled from a wide diversity of sources that all make sense and are attached to Giza and the Great Pyramid. Mm, interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. Like I've often said that's, you know, it's it's a device that, that has all of this reality encoded into it. Something that I, I, I wondered as well, I've um, when I was visiting a, a place in Ireland called Newgrange, mm -hmm. I noticed in Newgrange that the, the, there's a, an event that happens in Newgrange, like once a year the light shines into this chamber, blah, blah, blah. Right. And uh, the, the actual chamber, the, the passage into the chamber, if you draw a line out of that chamber, it crosses directly on Stonehenge. And, of course, Stonehenge is directly on line with the Great Pyramid. And I often wonder if there was some sort of a thing that happened there where somehow they, they, they did something to somebody's mind and they were able to amplify that signal and charge that through the pyramid as well. It's just a little theory that I had for a long time how there was some what what created the schism in human consciousness that led us into this trap or something whether that's related i don't know whether you've looked into newgrange or stonehenge or anything like that i mean it's pretty out there but it's just something that i i sort of got when i visited newgrange right well newgrange newgrange was finished in 3163 i have this in chronicle and i show you the sources 3163 bc and stonehenge was well was finished in 3113 bc which is the exact first year of the mayan long count which is 1,872,000 days to 2046 now 
these structures you're talking about, they were built during the vapor canopy civilization. And I have told people in my own videos, although I need to do a whole video about it, but one of the pre-flood civilizations where we have evidence of an unbroken infrastructure going back almost 5,000 years is the United Kingdom. Britain is has layers of civilization. Stonehenge, Karnak, Durrington Walls, the... Uh, uh, this uh, this th that area of the world. There is a reason why ninety six percent of all agroglyphs and crop circles appear in that small area of the world. There is energy vortexes that go back five thousand something years. And you're right, there is a deep connection. It is the exact same civilization that built Giza. Mm, yeah, I wondered what the connection was. I I totally felt it when I was there in Newgrange. Like we went into the chamber, I could feel it. I just got this whole flash. You have a, you have a lot of authors that have produced pretty interesting evidence about uh, all the ancient traditions of, of a Enoch type figure who was in the United Kingdom area. But way it was before way before it was called Britain. I think it was called Pridian, Pridian or something. Uh, the books I know the books of Prilith are the ancient library that was that was before the flood that had survived in old britain uh way before the coming of brutus and the trojan exiles and all that uh i have put max if you said oh uh, if you want me to i will send you chronicon i everything i am telling you right now is in my chronicon and uh people all over the world order my flash drive my flash drive has three thousand pages of historical data notes unpublished notes just in case anything ever happened to archaics or me i wanted to spread my material all all over the world and i have every continent um, uh, over 60 countries in the world now have copies of my flash drive some multiple copies but if you want just uh uh i need a mailing address i'll send you one for free but it's three thousand and pages of historical data with sources telling the exact books where they're found all chronologically arranged and uh the things that, that are coming out of my mouth in my videos people are now following they're printing up uh, my chronicon and putting it in, in large trapper keepers and big three ring binders and they follow my video uh, as i'm talking about these things in the videos so uh I, yeah. I have a i have a i have a large group that follows me when i do my chronicon videos yeah, yeah, for sure. I'll give you a, a mailing address and you can send it over. I'm in Mexico at the moment, so you'll be able to send it here to this address. Oh, yeah. I, I've sent it several to Mexico. Yeah, and um, what else was I going to say? Um, this, this, um, you, like, you, you're saying the uh, this is some sort of a switch that, that might break down this construct that we're in, the pyramid. Yes. You think that's yes. a good thing or a bad thing if we should break down? I mean, is it to... Um, for us to get out, or like if you think of this, uh, the concept of this being the possibility of this being a, a holding pen for this archontic mindset, you know. Okay. Oh, what, what do you think I, of, the, of the possibility? You know, some people say, oh, you know, we chose to come here and there were certain people that came here to raise the vibration, blah, blah, blah. Do you think there are volunteers that come here to try to, like I was saying before, if you start at the beginning and we can actually shift into wisdom rather than ego the way we always do and create this ourselves? Do you think that there's a possibility that there's certain souls that come to choose to come here and do that? I mean, you're getting a little new age and stuff, but I'm sure there's going to be people that will well, ask that question. Well, it's, a, it's a legitimate question because uh, we're always wondering context. We're always wondering the why. So here is here is what I truly believe in the most abbreviated format right here. All this all this stuff is dressing. Everything I found out about ancient calendar systems, the Nemesis Cataclysm, the unfolding of Phoenix, Nemesis X object, pre-flood world, vapor canopies, the unfolding of difference from the rise and fall of civilizations, Great Pyramid, every bit of this is just dressing. It's a mystery that's unfolding. It's a movie that we're playing out in. The real, the real reason we are here is because the oversoul cannot, cannot risk putting the wrong types of personalities personalities that have not matured personalities that, that have not uh, uh, acquired the well, the basically everything that they're supposed to they have not learned to use intuition empathy and imagination to be co-creators because the creation was not a singularity it was never an event the creation has never stopped it's ongoing and in order for immortals to receive their inheritance and i'm about to tell you what that is they have to prove themselves in an environment of risk even though there's really no risk to them because they're just living out life sims and they're living out 
avatars and you might have been here 72 times max in different cultures and different civilizations as different races so you could experience everything and each time there's a mind memory wipe but memory is holographic so it's all going to be returned to you but because the investment is so great, the Oversoul has to make sure that when you receive your immortal avatar and not the temporary temporary one that you're in right now, that you've earned that. Because to be a co-creator, uh, uh, that's a lot of power. And when it, when it comes to you going into an entire new realm of the creation to basically broadcast the things that you learned here to new civilizations and new creatures that never even even knew of such violence that didn't I never heard of all the stuff that you went through you're going to be amazing you're going to be godlike to them but you have and i have avatars that are being prepared for us but they're not like these bodies these avatars are immortal and they can do fantastic things but before our immortal personality can inhabit that white robe which is what it's just called in the book of Revelation. It's called a white robe. You will receive your inheritance. It will be a white robe. When you put that white robe on, it has to be the right personality. It has to be someone who has made it through the fires because their hell is not a future place. You're in it now. Purgatory isn't a place set aside. It, this place can be purgatory for you now. or And you could be an errant. This is an era is a very different type of human than other humans. 90%, maybe not more than 90% of all the people in this world today, they are the living dead. These are people who have burned out. They have lived so many life sims. They have given up. They have failed the test. They are not at all ready to receive an immortal avatar because if they receive that immortal avatar we would have we would have the creation of a demigod or a god who would who would wreak havoc wherever he went in in, in the oversoul's creation so there's two things i believe one the creation never stopped and two that means these simulacrums have to be started and stopped over and over to produce more immortals that are going to go out and be co-creators with the Oversoul. That's what this is about. And that's why my message in Archaics is no fear. Once you've adopted this belief system, what the hell could be wrong? What could you fear in this? Well, I don't care about mainstream media. I don't care about shots. I don't care about wars. I don't care about any of that. And when people send me emails of all this doom saying, I ignore them. Those are not the emails I answer. I answer those that are vibrating on my frequency, people who are searching for information. I answer my emails every day. But those who send me all that de all that all that dark sayings and all, and I'm not I'm not even entertaining it because to even enter to even ask me those tells me you're not you're not on the level. You're not you're not vibrating on the same frequency I am. Because if you're worried about all the negativity in the world, you're still participating in it. Mm. Well said, well said. I mean, I present a lot of negativity to people in my videos. I always have. I, I, but the, the reason I even started doing this because there were so many people that were presenting this negativity to people, but it was just doom, 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 doom. And I've right. been trying to present it to them saying, well, here's this information. Now you're aware of the information. It gives you the opportunity to heal the information and to prepare yourself for these changes that are coming. Well, you're now, I'm really trying to... Yeah, trying to... Try to try to create some balance for people so they feel empowered through this. You know, you mentioned um, Elil and Enki and this uh, stuff. I mean, I, I think there was some sort of uh, intervention, like you say, possibly using those names. I definitely don't trust the information that comes from Sitchin, though. Like I, I actually did for a while when I first came across Sitchin's work. I thought, wow, this explains a lot of stuff. And the more I looked into it, I thought, oh, this guy is misdirecting people. And yeah. Uh, so what what's your concepts on Sitchin? Well, I've read all the Earth Chronicles and I've read uh you still with me? My audio's oh, yeah. good? Oh yeah. Uh, I've read all the Earth Chronicles. I've even read a book that few people know about called Of Heaven and Earth that was edited by Sitchin with a long forward by Sitchin that's produced by a book tree book tree press in San Diego. I read that book as well. Uh, my publisher, Paul Tice, used to be the videographer for Sitchin, and I have I have a I have a, a file full of pictures that were actual of Sitchin all over the world where my publisher take my publisher sent me the whole archive. But having said all that 
Sitchin has very good historical and archaeological material that he has cited from books that have verifiable sources. And I, I'm cool with that. There's a lot of Sitchin I like. However, I'm a chronologist. And being a chronologist, I know that 100% of Zechariah Sitchin's chronographical information is totally in error. None of this happened at the times that he said it happened. It happened in far more recent history. It can easily be shown. And this is what I have an entire playlist on called the Anuna Files. My Anuna Files sets all the chronological material material is sitting straight and i and anybody who's been through the anuna files i haven't found anybody who's gone through all my videos of the anuna files and critiqued it i have everybody praising it saying hey man this is awesome it's genius i had no uh, people tell me all the time i had no idea that these calendars were interpreted this way i thought it was Sitchin's way and when they see that these ancient historians already had the answers and zechariah sitchin uh, oh he's not the only one but zechariah sitchin a lot of modern authors uh, they specifically omit these references. They don't mention them because it doesn't fit the narrative. So uh, Sitchin, Sitchin was funded. Let me tell you something. You can't just do all that on, on just because you sell published books. I'm an author. I've written 13 books. I don't have the finances to do what Sitchin did. I mean, travel all over the world with a whole crew, keeping people in hotels and motels and, and getting access to all these archaeological sites. No, man. People, people are Graham Hancock. You don't do that type of uh, on-site archaeology with whole crews and sets following you, keeping up in hotels and motels. Listen, you have to be funded, and to be funded, you must be pushing an agenda that is acceptable. Mm, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So anything else you want to say? Anything else you want to talk about, brother? Oh, hey, you know what? Sky's the limit. I mean, I'm, I'm no... Uh, I, I I have no perimeters, man. If you got a question, I'll just take off. I'm uh I will show my shirt off. I got this in the mail today, Max. Well, listen to me. I got a really good I got a really good subscriber base, and it might have something to do with my positivity. But like you said, I'm a doomsayer too. My channel has some very harrowing stuff on it. People get disturbed, but I'm also it's, telling it's, them it's, it's not inspiring, forgetting. though, brother. It's very very inspiring what you're saying. I mean, your whole perspective of it, and, and I love the um, the certainty of your information. Like I said, you know, when I first looked at you, and even you said on one of the interviews that some people see me as a bit egomaniacal. You know, and that was, i got to admit, that was my first impression. Well, this guy's oh. confident. And then when I started hearing it, I thought, actually, no, he's very, very confident in the quality of his information, which yeah. is very inspirational. So I appreciate I, that. I think it's very deserving that you're getting the attention that you are. Because, I mean, if you, you are correct and you appear to be, I mean, there's so much evidence to support this. I mean, the whole concept of the timelines being wrong. History is a lie agreed upon, as said right. by Holly, and the whole right. thing's a, a construct. And, yeah. and, you know, we've been suggesting that, you know, what we're referring to as a mud flood happened sometime maybe in the late 1800s or something. You're right. saying 1902, which would explain why there was so much mud through World War One, which was just mud everywhere. Yeah. Explain that. I mean, it all, it all makes sense. A lot of what you've said really fills in a lot of gaps. And this is really important and valuable information, you know, and it shows people why you shouldn't really be in fear of what they're trying to do with this system. I mean... I often call this a soul test. You know, you're giving away your soul just by complying. It's like you say, you're you can become a uh, an errant and just live on the outside of the whole thing, which is what right. I've done my whole life. I've just stepped back and observed. Yeah. I thought this is a freak show. I remember when I was four and I was talking to my teddy bear, saying, "This is this is all messed up." And can you please tell God he's put me on the wrong world? Can you please put me right. back on the right world? I wasn't supposed to be here this time. Yeah, I get it. I messed up, and I am. But uh, anyway. So uh, it's been really refreshing, actually, coming across your stuff, brother. It really has. Well, I have a theory that, and I tell my listeners all the time, it's completely theoretical, but it involves the Phoenix. It's something you just said. It's all. I have a theory that was basically instigated by my subscribers from them just asking asking so many questions. It dawned on me, man, some of these guys' comments, they may be right. I never took it into consideration. But... It seems that the mainstream media has a very fixed agenda at the fear porn to get everybody vibrating on this negative, on this real negative frequency. It doesn't matter because we have very few people today, Max, that are going back and doing sound bites of what the media was reporting in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. But when you do that and you go look at all, if somebody was recording all this stuff, you will see 95% of everything the media ever predicted 
the negative never came to pass. They just steady do it though. They predict, predict, and they get everybody vibrating on this negative frequency. Now I've already known all this. But one of my subscribers hit me with a sledgehammer. He said, do you think that this is a specific agenda by our controllers because the Phoenix targets these negative, this negative vibration and therefore it scatters the signal and Phoenix can't really search out the elite like it was designed to do. It was originally designed to, 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 to seek out these elitists and take them out. That's why every 138 years, these elite ruling family families disappear on retreats. They disappear and they go on these Island voyages and all, that every single 138 years the ruling families scatter they're underground they're hiding and as soon as may is over with they resurface and unleash their wealth again and all, all their stuff this pattern is verifiable so mm. this subscriber this subscriber told me he said man well you think this new this new program they're using the media to get the whole collective to fear so when the phoenix comes in may 2040 it's not going to be able to do what it normally does and seek them that are hiding underground and cause this, these these uh, massive uh, uh, deals. The signal's too, too, it's too ubiquitous now, so it's going to take out a lot of people. It's like a sacrifice because it's always going, it's always going to be activated. But uh, anyway, it's just really I, it's, it's a theory. It's a theory that was instigated by the It's an interesting theory. I mean, fear, fear is a very strong vibration. That's what I've been saying to people. You can't fear any of this. No stake in the outcome is the best way to look at this. You walk the path of the warrior, which is the ability right. to be able to uh, face infinity without flinching. The knack of being able to face and, and um, uh, being able to take face with serenity odds and circumstances that are not included in your calculations and to simply go where the path leads you. No stake in the outcome. What would you fear? You're only here for a breath. You're here for such a short time. And the one thing you can't right. do is die. So what's to fear, you know? And it's when you consider it to be an emotional mirror, well, you know, what are we creating? <clears throat> Yeah, but that's uh, interesting. That's, that's a really interesting concept, what you're saying there about creating like a, a smoke screen for themselves. Hey, and and you, look hey, at what they're doing to the, you look at what they're doing to the world now, what's it going to look like by 2040? How much fear are people going to be in? Like, Listen, uh, we need to, I, I, I have to say this right here because it just dawned on me. We can reduce this phenomenon and this theory to the lowest common denominator. Think about this. When a person has no fear in the presence of a dog next to a person who is scared witless of that dog, which one does the dog attack? Mm, exactly. Wow. Exactly. Froze just like that. Yeah, hey, you're, yeah you're back. You're back. I, I don't, I, what was the last thing I said, man? You said, I heard you said when, when a man is facing a dog. Okay, cool. Let, check this out. I'm going to illustrate a point about the Phoenix, about the Phoenix now. All right. It acts with it. It seems to act like intelligence, and it targets those who are, who are vibrating at a negative frequency, which was normally the elite because they had a lot of guilt. They had much to fear. Now, it's also it's also commonly known now in my research and my subs that the elite have always known about the phoenix. That's what the thirty third degree of Freemasonry is about. It's it's totally about the phoenix. So, anyway, explain, explain uh, that to me. Why is the thirty third about the phoenix? Okay, the first story, Albert Pike in 1881 published Morals and Dogma, which perfectly outlines all the 32 degrees and the symbols and what they mean. And when you follow them, you see basically a template. Well, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Just leave it right there. Remember what you're saying. I'm going to start another meeting because this one's going to end in 10 minutes and we're going to forget again and it's going to cut us off. All right. Cut it off now. You're talking about Albert Pike and Morals and Dogma and what 33 has to do with okay this whole thing and i'm just going to start another meeting okay i'll end this one and start another one all right all right <laughs> sorry about this brother that's good all right yeah i just thought it was prudent to get that taken care of now okay before, hey, we, get in, before we get into another full-blown conversation and get cut off halfway through that's okay so did i finish my illustration with the dog yeah 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 you did you did okay. and we were talking about, i said what what is 33 because you were talking about um this is what 33 okay. is all about it's all to do with uh this event so how is the 33rd degree i've often speculated that um one of the safe zones would be between the two 33rd parallels perhaps that's one of the things it's about but okay well, check this out we have a we have a uh 
Morals and Dogma in the 1880s, published by Albert Pike, he's very specific about the meaning of the symbols and rituals of the first 32 degrees. But when you get to that book, in the very end of that book, and I had an original copy from the 1880s, when you get to the end of that book, which some of my subscribers have verified because they have the they have morals and dogmas, when you get to the very end, when you open it up to the 33rd degree, it's nothing but a, a loose page. It's a cover page. On the, the beautiful seal of the 33rd degree is of the phoenix now all throughout the first 32 degrees like the 13 ancient ancient degrees the first 13 degrees are the ancient uh, order of freemasonry it's all about the vapor canopy pre-flood world all the way up to the building of the great pyramid it's called the royal arch of enoch starting with the 14th degree we have the accepted modern degrees these are, this is a template of world history going through the Greek Orphic and the Delphic periods going all the way, all the way to the Roman periods, Byzantine periods. It's, it's a beautiful, it's beautiful symbolism. But the very end is Phoenix and Phoenix, Phoenix is the symbol of reset. Phoenix is the symbol that the Freemasonry will not divulge. They won't explain anything about the 33rd degree. So, but I mean, you see, you see the Phoenix in, 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 in Freemason sim, symbols everywhere. Buildings that, buildings that had architects of free, uh, uh, that were Freemasons, they have Phoenixes on their cornices all the way around the buildings. And yeah, it's not, it's really nothing, man. But, uh, it's, uh, Phoenix is basically the symbol of a, uh, of a civilization that has been destroyed and is, and is being rebuilt. This is what the, the old Phoenix motif was. And, uh, yeah, the, uh, I believe, I believe 100% that, the secret fraternal benefit societies like the Elks and the Moose, the Foresters, the Archer Guilds, uh, Orphic Faith, they all knew about the Phoenix. They had, but all this information has now been hidden. But uh, for me to put it together required going through a wide, diverse amount of sources and pulling out all this chronological material. So that's something you and I have never discussed, such as uh, uh, we cannot ignore when we find an ancient text that a Greek writer said that Aristarchus said that the world is destroyed every 24, 84 years. You can't ignore so specific a number. Why did he say 24, 84, not 24 centuries or 25 centuries? When you see that number, fine, you find out, okay, well, it's divisible by 138. But then you find out that many ancient authors also said that there were destructions in between every 1656 years. Others said it was 4968 years. Others said 2070 years. Others said it was 2760 years. Every single number I just itemized is divisible by 138. So we're looking at we're looking at ancient chronological materials that were that were basing their calculations off historical records that were existing in the times of those authors for which we don't have a trace of today. Yet they preserve the math. Every one of these histories that was found among the Maya, the Inca, the Quiche, the ancient Greeks, the Aegeans, the House of Atreus, the old Mycenaeans, when these numbers are pulled from out of all these texts, and I show them in my Phoenix videos, you can't ignore that they're all divisible by 138. This is a timeline that was known in ancient times, and I finally, it took a long time, but I finally found out why we don't know about it today and i released a video about it most people don't really understand the implications of that video but i released a video about the origin of the anno domini calendar that we're in right now and what the roman catholic church hid when they created that calendar it was one of the most harrowing phoenix reset dates in history it was 522 a.d it started the dark ages and everything that happened at that period has been recorded we have all the historians and i i, I list all the events that happened at that time but what we had was the old phoenix cycle of 552 years which was recorded in the buddhic calendar which was acknowledged by the roman catholic church at the time they shelved that they hid it and they created the ad calendar and ever since that time at the beginning of the dark ages the western world pretty much forgot all about what the eastern world already knew the thing it's called the thing calendar the thing was the ancient chinese phoenix but uh yeah, it's a, I have a video. You you probably haven't got to that one yet, but it's all about how how the the papacy hid hid the Phoenix phenomenon. Okay, so with these 138 year cycles, you're saying that there is now an event that happens every 138 years, or is it just like still happening every 552 well, years? No, no, no. Only four times 
in recorded human history do we have phoenix phenomenon that happened to the entire world only four times about seven times it's happened to an entire hemisphere talking about mud flood fallout volcanism or uh, massive earthquakes or uh, red dust red rains all over but every other time it's been highly local it's been very regional it's very very specific to one little area it's, it's almost as if it just lets you know that okay i'm here i'm doing this right here y'all y'all can get back on your right you know, on the right timekeeping system because this is what what phoenix was for it is i'm very specific in my in my, in my sources phoenix Phoenix was designed to keep the calendar. That's what it was called in ancient Egypt. Phoenix was regarded in as the Phoenix was regarded in the mansion of the Phoenix in Heliopolis, where they kept the Bin Bin Stone. The Bin Bin Stone was a replica of the chief cornerstone that's supposed to go on top of the Great Pyramid. It was understood in ancient Egypt that this stone at one time would have to be put back on that monument, and it had something to do with the phoenix. That's why it was housed in the mansion of the phoenix in Heliopolis. And Heliopolis, Heliopolis is, is merely the Greek name for a far more ancient city that goes back to Sumerian times called Anu. It's A-N-N period in you and uh it, it, this uh it was basically the the city of the thunderbird mm, yeah yeah I've, uh, I've read all about all that stuff i actually wrote about that in a book in 2005 but um and you're saying that he, the, the phoenix was a timekeeping mechanism like was it always visible in the sky or did it, it was keeper it was keeper of the calendar because the archons have a role and that role is to take me, take take mankind off track to implement new timekeeping systems their own types of resets to start new calendars to confuse humans as to the times because in the very beginning when the Olmec calendar, the Mayan calendar, the Vedic calendar, the Sumerian calendar, when all these ancient calendars were implemented, the end was already known. This is why those calendars were counted in days. Mayan calendar is 13 back then, 144,000 days each. 13 periods is 1,872,000 days. They calculated back then that the end of these timekeeping systems would be in 2046. They knew that then. The Vedic calendar, the Olmec calendar, they're all based on the same predicates of counting days, not years. And Zechariah Sitchin knew this, but he still published otherwise, making people believe that Anunnaki history went back half a million years, but it doesn't. The Sumerian king list is very specific. It says that before the flood happened, seven kings ruled over the entire infrastructure over a pentopolis. The final ruling capital was Shurapak, and it was these seven kings ruled for 241,200 shars. Zechariah Sitchin is trying to get people to believe that that's 241,200 years that seven individuals ruled over civilization. Well, common sense dictates that there isn't anything in this world that's going to be important 240,000 years after any event. Because multiple floods happened at that time, multiple empires and kingdoms have, have re risen and fallen. It's all BS because the original timekeeping system wasn't a year, it was a day. And this is this is mentioned in the Oralind manuscript, it's mentioned in the Jewish Haggadoth, it's mentioned in the book of Genesis. The very first timekeeping system mentioned in Genesis is the evening and the morning was the first day. The mm. evening and the morning was the second day. Genesis introduces that. And even it even goes even further in, in explaining that the pre-flood va vapor canopy world was exactly 1656 years. This is in Genesis. Again, 1656 years is divisible by 138. And you find this everywhere throughout the Old Testament as well between these cataclysmic events. Mm, interesting stuff. There always seems to be a depopulation event that happens before these as well. When you look at the like, Bolshevik, Bolshevik Revolution, um, yep. you know, different flu events and whatever. Interesting now, you know, it, like they don't want um, don't want a lot of people making it through. They don't want people that might have any memory of what the world was like making it through. If the, if the survivors are underground with their infrastructure intact and their libraries, I released a video recently explaining why all these YouTube channels are coming up with good data about text being falsified or whatever, but my take is totally different. 
I believe these historical events happen and that the timeline, the timeline is real. I, I wrote Chronicle and I, I can I can show you what happened century by century. But they're right about the provenance of these texts, because every 138 years, these libraries are being brought back to the surface from underworld repositories. While they're down there, new copies are being made of older texts. Now, yes. somebody, now somebody else had brought to my attention that at around 1902, um, Carnegie had funded $45 million to fund over a thousand libraries. Who does that? Right there in 1902 and 1903. All of a sudden you want to fund. That's not what happened. What really happened was these libraries were preserved underground. These books were brought back to the public because the elite aren't what we think they are. And I have videos explaining that too. Yes, they're humans. They have families and all that, but there are members of the elite, I believe, that are also humanitarians. Their hands are tied. They can't just go out and save everybody and all that because oh, they would violate the tenets of their order. They would be kicked out of their order. They would be killed and murdered, just like we see happen all the time among the elite. They kill each other. But some of them are preserving historical integrity because every 138 years they take these prized books down with them. And if their certain facilities survive underground, then they bring them back up every 138 years. And I would like to tell you that this is new, Max, but it's not. In 1962, we found the very first underground facility in Turkey from ancient times. Since then, mm. our Archaeologists have found 59 more. Do you have any idea how many people could fit down there? It's the exact same region of the world, Anatolia, that we have traditions of a king called Anakos. And that king was made famous in ancient Phrygia, which is the exact same geographical area where those cities are. Anikos became famous because he foretold of a cataclysm that was coming and told his people that you will not survive if you stay on the surface. So he built cities and the entire population was saved underground. And when the fallout was over, he brought them back up. Mm. This happened so long ago that by the time of the Hittite Empire in 18, 17th and 16th century BC, we're talking we're talking almost 4,000 years ago that the Hittites found the first three layers of these cities and, they, and there's Hittite graffiti. Archaeologists have found Hittite graffiti all over the first three levels saying that even the Hittites didn't go to the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth levels of those cities incredible man we have found even phoenix hill in china is another underground it's called phoenix hill it's called <laughs> it's, yeah it's called fei hu but it's uh oh, phoenix hill is in china it has been discovered the archaeologists are baffled it could have held a hundred thousand people easily and it's an underground fallout facility that was made in ancient times so long ago that not even the chinese remember it all they know is the tr tradition attached to it and they call it phoenix hill Mm, yeah, that city in Turkey is absolutely amazing, that underground city, and it's huge. Right. You, know, you could fit so many people in there. Right. Some guy found it, like, looking through his cupboard or something, excavating the back of his cupboard and found yeah. A, yeah. a gap, and, went, and there was this whole complex. Well, since, since 1962, archaeologists have found corridors that just went, and they excavated yeah. the corridors and opened up into a whole other city. They have found 59 more since 1962. Yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. Oh. A date you mentioned before, 2046. You're talking about this event, this Phoenix event's happening on the 16th of May, 2040. Right, right. Well, what happens in 2046? Okay, remember I told you that the historical record is very definitive. And you're, you're talking about the Mayan calendar and stuff here. This is yes, the yes, there's, this two on. Different, there's two different protocols unfolding. One of them is every 138 years. One of them is every 792 years. And it goes back all the way, 58, 59 centuries. And uh, the all the major events of world history are on these two two patterns the phoenix and this nemesis x object i call it nemesis x because it's an unknown factor i really don't know what it is i believe because of what it's historically attached to and what is what is attached to in the future the hopi blue kachina prophecies is that it is not an intruder planet even if it's simulated it's not it's a super construction that's hidden in plain sight in our sky and it's going to crash into the earth it is inhabited it is a it is used as a control mechanism over humanity and when it crashes 
the scales are going to be removed from people's eyes. People, this is what the apocalypse is about. The apocalypse isn't about just taking people out. It's going to do that too. It's collateral consequence. Uh, those who are vibrating on the wrong frequency. But the apocalypse means to unveil. If you're vibrating on the right frequency, you are going to see and experience things that others are not during the apocalypse. Because during the apocalypse, the vapor canopy returns. And for those who, those who are, the, the, those who are archaic scholars, they know all about the vapor canopy. I beat that into them over and over and over because the ancient world does not make sense unless you take into consideration that this infrastructure of the Great Pyramid and Stonehenge and Karnak, and, uh, like I said, like I mentioned, Durrington Walls and Newgrange, none of that was possible unless the vapor canopy was there. And the vapor canopy is mentioned in many different ways in many different cultures and civilizations. A great, it's a totally different biosphere. It's not like the world today. But the vapor canopy is coming back. That's how the apocalypse will unfold. This is why people will, will want to die but cannot kill themselves. This is in Revelation. It's also described in 2nd Ezra. Open wounds will heal in, in minutes. I'm talking about people will be able to hold their breath for very long periods of time. It says killing somebody during the apocalypse means that you're really trying to commit murder because you can't do it accidentally. you got to really go through the motions to actually kill somebody during a vapor canopy. The atmospheric pressure is intense. The oxygen level is fantastic. The, the ambient radiation, radiation that is trapped under the canopy that we are that we are exposed to during that time has people, animals, flora and fauna growing to astonishing sizes. Three times in the historical record, the vapor canopy has come back, but each time it collapsed after about 10 to 20 years. But when it was here, it started an age of heroes. It started a, a, a time period where everybody born under that canopy after that cataclysm was taller, faster, stronger, smarter, and, and all that. And this is recorded over and over in the, in, the, in, the, in Hesiod and different different traditions. The last time it the last time the vapor canopy created an age of heroes was uh, 1687 BC. Before that was 22 was 2239 BC. Before that was 3439 BC. This canopy, this canopy is the reason why the historical record is very, very adamant that we had a period of Titans. But when the Titans, when the Titans lost power, is when the giants were emerging. The there's no difference between Titans and giants. They're still human. The difference is, is humans born under the vapor canopy were heroic, huge. Now, when the vapor can it be collapsed their immediate first generation sons and daughters were huge too by those who were born 100 years later who were born under this biosphere the one we're in now so and in one 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 small abbreviated period of time after 2239 bc we had titans in the world who were of heroic stature gigantic but they had considered themselves to be normal sized humans that biosphere collapsed but they're still alive they're giving birth to to giants. These giants regard their regard their parentage as gods. They're titans. But the sons and daughters of the next generation, the giants, are giving birth to normal sized humans. This is all within it within a one hundred year period. This is why the Greek the Greek texts and the Greek traditions are so specific about these three different orders of humanity. They all consider themselves to be humans, but they regarded each other as different as different types of humans because of the environment that they were born in. The giants were the most unusual because they were huge too, but they were nowhere near as large as the Titans. But they were bigger than ordinary humans. And this is this is the time period when Nimrod was born, who was the who was the giant. He was regarded by all cultures as the giant killer. In Sumerian records, his name was Amar Udaak, but later on in Akka, he was called Merodak. But Merodak became Marduk in Babylon, where he was the patron deity. He was alive throughout this whole time. In the Book of Jasher, he lived for two hundred and fifteen years. And I have a book on Gumroad called uh, uh, King of the Giants, Mighty Hunter of World Mythology, which is all about his, his life and all the ancient cultures that remembered him. But he was a giant who went, who basically became famous because he went back and killed as many titans as he could because he feared that the titans could still give, could, could basically 
copulate with giants and still produce even bigger people. So he wanted to put a stop to that. And uh, it's a it's a it's a fascinating story. But it's all it's all it's all well referenced. And I'm pretty sure you're familiar with uh, Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. It's yeah, a, yeah. It's a old book from the 1800s where it maps out Nimrod's life. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the Old Testament, the same person, Amar Udak, who was Merodach, who was Marduk, uh, uh, was in the Hebrew writings of the Book of Jasher and Jubilees and the Jewish Haggadoth text and in the Book of Genesis. He is Nimrod. This is the mighty hunter before the Lord. This is the one. But when it, but what, what, what Christianity has turned that into is that he was a hunter of animals and all that. And he wasn't. He was the mighty hunter before the Lord. He hunted the Titans. And this is remembered as Glooscap in the ancient uh, Native American traditions. He's remembered everywhere in the ancient Americas. He's the giant killer. He went against the frost giants, the uh, uh, the rainbow giants. There's so many traditions of White Rabbit and Glooscap who went off in, on this great uh, mighty uh, uh, archer who went and fought the giants. It's all memories of this guy uh, because... The Americas were populated over five centuries after this cataclysm. So these people are descended from people who had come from this area of the world, and they remember every bit of it. So that's what my book is about, uh, King of the Giants, uh, describing this guy. But it's a vapor canopy that's coming back uh, after May 20, 2040. Phoenix is the only thing that brings the vapor canopy, because Phoenix is also called Vulcan. Phoenix causes volcanism, like in 1902. Two scientists, both of them in their late 50s and 60s, two scientists were studying at Martinique in the French Caribbean. They were exposed to the ambient radiation coming out of Mount Paley. Mount Paley, two weeks before, had detonated and incinerated 30,000 people in 1902. Uh, during the Phoenix year of 1902, 30,000 people incinerated, and the only person that survived was the man named August, Augustus. Augustus was in a pit about 20 feet underground because the very next day they were going to execute him. He's the only survivor from, from Martinique. But uh, uh, it's a true story from 1902. But the vo the, vo the, vo the ambient radiation from, from that exposed to that. And while they were there, they didn't take they didn't realize they had both grown two inches. It was only after they came into contact with other people that they knew of that they found out well, they, they, they both grew two inches. It, it was scientifically documented. But this is the same phenomenon that the vapor canopy brings because the vapor canopy traps this ambient radiation in this uh, uh, intent in this increased uh, barometric pressure and this vapor canopy is a ocean above that is caused by volcanic ash and phoenix fallout the phoenix fallout is red particles and red dust that has organic materials and it layers the atmosphere At the same time the volcanic pumice and plus and ash they, they layer the atmosphere, traps the ambient radiation. After about a 15-year period, we literally have a mesosphere that is so thick that the entire world during the daytime is a dark purple light. And this has been described. I have videos that, 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 that cite these sources. This dark purple light makes things grow to astonishing sizes. It has been replicated in Glen Rose, Texas, in a biosphere that they constructed. They use that dark purple light. They, use, they increase the atmospheric pressure. Uh, and uh, they replicated the mesosphere and they made insects and fruit flies, beetles to grow three times their size and to live three times longer, made plants grow big. So they did this in a very small contained field. Imagine the entire world under this vapor canopy. Now your animals, your reptiles, your, your, your amphibians, your fish, humans, plants, animals, everything's now growing to astonishing sizes because carbon dioxide rich atmosphere and oxygen enriched atmosphere and a nitrogen rich soil topsoil has everything growing to to basically uh, 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 premium conditions and this is after Phoenix burns the world what do you know about fire 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 increases the yield of any gardener hundreds of I read a report that said 880 percent yield if you take ashes and charred wood and mix it with your topsoil and plant a garden it it increases 880 percent yield and this is why forest fires 40 years later that area is even more lush with with vegetation than it was before so we're talking about a world that gets burned destroyed liquefaction mud floods red red organic compounds falling from the sky uh, 
that. This is what Phoenix does. But it's basically fertilizing a new world. Remember, Phoenix is building a new world out of the ashes of the old. This is what it does. Now, these bad episodes only happen like every 552 years. But uh, that's 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 real iffy. It's every, it's here every 138 years. But there was a period in ancient times where every 552 years it was the it was the big one. So. Uh, I'm thinking 2040 is just going to be in line with basically what the sixth seal of the apocalypse says, because the sixth seal of the apocalypse is the Phoenix. That's exactly what happens during a Phoenix phenomenon. The the sun turns black as sackcloth. Uh, the air thickens, stars fall from the sky, the moon turns blood red, terrible earthquakes happen, people hide in the uh, in the dens and the rocks and the caves. This is in the sixth seal of the apocalypse. And it fits the narrative perfectly because the six seals have nothing to do with the actual apocalypse. They don't. These are the events that tell the world for those who know and those who are paying attention to world events. The six seals are the six events that because the seventh is not known. The seventh are events that happen outside the construct. They don't happen inside the construct and they're described in Revelation. But the six terrestrial events are mapped out so everyone knows when the apocalypse is going to begin. It does not begin until after the Phoenix phenomenon does what it does. The six seals are required to be broken off the scroll before the tetramorph can open the scroll and read what the apocalypse is going to do. Because the apocalypse begins with uh, the seven trumpets. All seven trumpets is when the apocalypse begins. And those events could not happen unless there was a vapor canopy in place. Mm, right. Certainly said a lot there. I've got so many questions that I don't even know where to begin. But... Um... Well, Oh, we can always do another video, Max. <laughs> That's all good. But um, when you're saying like the pyramid couldn't have been constructed if the Vapor Academy wasn't there, what, why is that? Oh, well, one, we can't make it today. We can't make it today. Under increased atmospheric pressure, stone is not going to weigh near what it weighs today. In addition to that, the machines that were employed uh, to put together the, the geopolymers, and it, there would have never there would have never been that much stress on technology to put the Great Pyramid together. Yeah, uh, interesting. It's uh, an interesting way. You think they were you think they were boxed up and. You think they were boxed up and poured, the pyramids? I would suggest they were poured. Like oh, pyramids. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind. There's no yeah. doubt. I read Christopher Dunn's research on all. Uh, you know, he's an engineer. He put out a lot of some, some pretty phenomenal books about Giza. Uh, Christopher Dunn, uh, his books are phenomenal, uh, showing the geopolymers, uh, showing the magnetite that's going in all different directions, which is absolutely impossible unless you're dealing with a synthetic stone that was poured. Because a natural stone will always have magnetite pointing in the exact same directions. Because when rock, when igneous rock cools, it always has enough time for magnetite to align to, to, to magnetic yeah. exactly, Well, You don't yeah. find that. And you also find chemical compounds, real trace amounts of barrel and, and, and CT something. I can't remember what it was that's not naturally found these are synthetic they have to be made but they're found in the geo the, the uh, geopolymer construction of the limestone it's not natural limestone mm -hmm. it's real limestone that was quarried in egypt it's real limestone but oh, yeah. it was well, it was liquefied and compounds were added to it that 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 limestone from the Giza quarry is actually water soluble you can actually if you can get a little piece of it and sneak it oh. out they don't like you to because of course it's a geyser but you can pinch a little rock take it home into your motel room put it in a glass of water and it's dissolved by the morning so wow. it's really soluble have you ever read any percy fawcett stuff there's a book called exploration fawcett which talks about a blue i'm familiar with who he is i'm yeah. familiar with who he is he's uh controversial about the crystal skull yeah, his, yeah, dis yeah. his disappearance in south america yeah yeah there's a lot more to it than that there's a it's he he, it's, he <laughs> went in there and mapped all the borders like he went in there with a sextant and a compass and a, and a canoe and he mapped all the borders of peru and colombia and like pretty amazing feat to have done this on wow. foot with a couple of guides and um he was looking for lost cities and all sorts of stuff but he came across the legend of this guy called franco Raposa, who talked about this uh these plants that you could you could dissolve these plants and they were using them to soften stone and right. that's how all the buildings and all these walls in Saksayo Arm and Oleo Tatumbo and all these walls, yeah. these are all built by softening stone. These are essentially a form of geopolymer as well. Right. right. Which is why the joints are all perfect and the outsides are all uneven and they look like they've been 
pushed in and held in place and stuff, you know? There, I mean, that, that might be true, and I have read that in the books of David Hatcher Children's. I have read the, so, the stone softening deals, but I've also come across the interesting theory that, uh, uh, like Dale Pond's research on sympathetic vibratory physics, the uh, cr making stone vibrate at a frequency that mm. the, hu mm. the human hand can, can shape it. Yeah, yeah, and even with uh, like using sound frequencies and stuff like that. I mean, I would suggest this right. is how they moved the stones at Baalbek as well. Um, that these were probably shaped that way and moved in that way using sound frequencies. Yeah. We're going to run out of video time again. This is going for a long time. This conversation, totally enjoying this conversation. <laughs> but we're going to yeah. run out of video time again. So look, we might as well end it. Okay, okay. But we can do it again. It's been a, it's been a great we're conversation. Done. It's really we're good done. to connect with you. Well, there's so, a lot of a lot of people have been sending me emails saying, "Hey, man, when are you going on with Max?" How can you keep teasing us? So, uh, yeah, yeah, a few people have been commenting on my videos as well, yeah. And like I said to them, look, I don't even know if I'm just going to just want to catch up with the guy. I've got nothing planned. We're just going to have a chat. If it's no. worth posting them, I'll post it. So I will. I'll edit this down and get rid of some of these breaks and video dropouts. Cool, and stuff. cool. And um, it'll probably get posted tomorrow night. When it does, right. I'll send you a link. Feel free to download it, repost it, whatever. It's all good. Uh, what I'll do is uh, you can send in an email, send me whatever links you want for me to put in the description box, and I'll post it on my channel as well. Well, there's only the crowhouse.com, man. That's it. I'm banned from everywhere. I'm banned from, from wow. everywhere. Like I'm banned from YouTube. I'm banned from Spotify. I'm banned from SoundCloud, from LinkedIn. Wow. Um, they just let me back on Twitter a couple of months ago. I don't know why. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm on BitChute and I'm on Odyssey. So that's it. I'll send you a link to the homepage of my website. Okay. And, uh, We'll go from there, but I'll get this posted probably about now or somewhere tomorrow. It'll be posted, and I'll send you the link. But it's been okay. a great chat, brother, and uh, really good to connect with you. And, hey, man, uh, it has been good. We'll have to uh, we'll have to catch up again and stay in touch. Anytime you want to just have a chat about anything, just give me a yell. It'd be great to catch up and just have a chat anytime. Awesome. It's really, really refreshing to find your work, man. It really is. So, well, I mean, uh, you know what? We didn't even talk about it, but, you know, we have a mutual friend who's no longer with us anymore. And uh, that's how I came into contact with you, uh, watching watching your uh, watching your uh, interview with uh, Jimmy, yeah, uh, EO, Jimmy James. EOTT. Jimmy James was a lovely guy. I only did a couple of conversations with him, but uh, he's a lovely guy. It was a great shame when we lost him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's uh, a, lot, a lot of my listeners know him. All right, all right Max, until next time. No worries, brother. Stay in touch. Good to catch up. All right. Bye bye. All right. <laughs>